Now, what this means is this afternoon, we can all benefit from an enormous amount of knowledge and expertise in the area of privacy and data protection from people who work day to day in mobile market research and in Derek's case, have legal training and also really involved with the industry association. So I'd encourage you all to really take advantage of the collective wisdom of the group and ask questions. So to keep things interesting, I've decided to gamify the panel discussion. We've got three copies of this book that's called SMR's Answers to Contemporary Market Research Questions. The first copy will go to the person who asks the first relevant question to the panel. <laughs> the second copy will go to the person who asks the most interesting or thought-provoking question. And the third copy will go to the person who asks the trickiest question. And I'm quite sure that Derek would advise me to say that the panel members will decide who wins, their decisions are final, and no correspondence will be entered into. <laughs> so, Firstly, Martin and Stephen, um, you're both based in Asia, and recently there have been a number of changes to data protection and privacy legislation around Asia Pacific. Briefly, what are the main things that people should be thinking of in this area, and what are the key issues and challenges? So I'm answering from the Market Research Society perspective. Um, it's, it's obviously weighed heavily on us, the fact that there's been the new uh, PDPA law that has come in uh, to Singapore as of uh, this year. Um, it's prompted us to look to um, look for legal counsel in that area and it also has meant that when policies are being decided we're having to be more involved um, and that is also another reason for us to, to look to expand our committee to ensure that we have um, someone who's got some really strong experience in this area. We've been able to find that fortunately as some of the larger businesses here um, do have their own in-house legal teams. Um, and they volunteer their time for us, and that time is then spent um, helping us advise our members on what we need to do. Now that can be including holding conferences, um, seminars, um, providing um, feedback based on um, what we know of it. Um, at our last conference, we had a speaker from, um, uh, I can't remember his name, I'm afraid we were talking about a, about a year ago now, but he was also introducing the data laws. Um, so being involved in the Market Research Society, and not just in, in Singapore, but in the societies around Asia, I feel is a very good way uh, for, for uh, researchers or people involved in the research industry um, to understand and help understand and get some support in the areas of what needs to happen. Um, I'd say from the society's perspective in Singapore, our largest issue is, is not around the process of opt-in because many of us operate on a very strong code of practice. We actually use the ESMR code of practice here in Singapore. Um, the different societies such as AMSRIS have their own um, in Australia. Um, and we work together um, across, a, company, across a, a conglomeration called APRC, which is the Asia Pacific Research Committee, um, where we all share um, information and news and what's going on. Um, now what that means is when the Singapore um, Protection Act came into place, Privacy Protection Act came into place, we share that information across the region. Um, so the members in each country have an, op have an opportunity to learn more about what's happening and I think the good thing with Singapore is they consulted, the government did consult with other countries that has laws that are similarly, similarly in place. Now what that's meant is that we're able to adopt um, a best practice um, that has come from, um, in, in our case, MRS UK. Um, and our members will be signing up to what's called the Fair Data Privacy um, Guidelines, essentially. And it works in, con in conjunction with our existing code of practices. Um, where there might be difficulty for um, some of the agencies to abide by this is actually more of a technology base. So it's understanding about how to keep um, their, their respondent data secure. Um, for instance, what cloud services they can use, um, what, um, uh, how, that, how they're able to prevent um, hackers, for instance, or, um, or misuse of data, training their staff. And this is, as a society, is areas that we're starting to put more emphasis on um, and helping our members um, and obviously other uh, regional members to become, have a better understanding of how to abide by this. Eventually, um, we will be looking at uh, the process would be to look at auditing this over time as well, um, but essentially making sure that there's a fair, quali fair data mark on each of these businesses so clients um, who use us can understand why we do this and, 
and also have some better um, information around the, the Act and how it applies in the different countries, because every country will be slightly different. Hong Kong, for instance, um, privacy data that, uh, could be something that's publicly aware, like Facebook, for instance, as well. Um, where in Singapore, public data is public data. Um, so there's, there's a range of different things we need to be aware of, but from the society perspective, our, our job is to try and um, uh, let people know what it is, help them with the issues, um, and provide seminars and greater understanding. Right. Um, so, I mean, Martin's given you an example of Singapore being very collaborative and the industry being collaborative. Um, my own first-hand experience, I actually live in uh, Malaysia. Um, in the last couple of months, we've now actually had, or we'd had talk about it for quite a while, of having privacy um, laws and legislation brought in. Um, literally, they landed within a couple of weeks of notice. Now we're scurrying around getting some legal advice on it. So some countries are more open and more collaborative, others just push through legislation. So I think that's also a reality um, that we have to face. Um, fortunately, there is some good cooperation going on. Um, I think, Sue, um, partly why I'm explaining why I'm actually up on stage here, um, I also want to appeal to everyone in this audience, and maybe we can do that towards the end, but um, being on this working committee, um, it's a collaboration between the um, global, um, is it GBRC, GBRN, sorry, and also ESMA, um, as to what sort of guidelines you as an industry want around um, data protection and data privacy. So I'm very keen, there's a number of us that will be part of this working group, but very much we want to reach out to you. What things do you want guidelines on? So um, that's something, hopefully we can get some contributions today, or if not, um, please email me after the event, because um, I think on the back of what you were saying, Martin, the more we can share and collaborate, as an industry, this is a, a major hygienic factor that we all must, always must be across um, protecting our respondents and protecting our industries. Um, I can talk more about also being part of WPP. Big global entities are very worried about any risk uh, that might occur. I mean, you, Derek will talk in a moment, obviously MasterCard in the same vein. Um, corporations have to be very concerned, obviously. Um, the only other little concern I have is that um, there's a massive proliferation of who we engage with and sometimes I've found that um, we're dealing with third parties in, in an, a rather obscure country um, and people haven't thought about even asking the question, are they even aware of their own obligations? I mean, some countries mightn't have formal legislation but still, you as the company that are employing someone in another country, you still have an obligation to follow that. Dan, with your SMR hat on, are there some global issues that might be you know, beyond what we've been talking about in Asia that are worth flagging for people today? Have you, have you seen Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? <laughs> yes. Okay. In that film, they go back in time and bring people into the modern day and get their perspective on the world. Now, Leonardo da Vinci said, the eyes are the window to the soul. And I think if he was alive today, he would say the mobile is the window to the soul. And there are so many stories, anecdotes, a lot of them personal for people in this room, of your mobile betraying the secrets of your heart and revealing everything about you. And I think that's perhaps the biggest global privacy challenge that we have to wrestle with. What are the key issues you think that researchers here today should be thinking about, planning for, that perhaps we haven't considered up until now? Right. Um, well, before I say anything, <laughs> really, um, well, you shouldn't take this as legal advice. You know? <laughs> Go get your own lawyers. I'm sure Martin can you know, provide you with some good references. <laughs> and uh, I'm really you know, speaking in, in my own personal capacity, you know, not representing MasterCard. So on your point, Sue, really the, um, I think just picking on the point earlier, it's really about security. I mean, we've seen in 2013, I think I was in the last year's conference in Asia, and I, and I said 2013 will be the year of the breach. It will be even the year of the breach, and it will be you, right? Because everyone knows that data is the new big oil. Everyone wants to get that data. If you don't secure it, 
you lose one, obviously you lose credibility in the market, you, know, you lose money because of financial penalties. Most importantly, you lose trust. And when you have, and I guess in a industry where you want to be self-regulated and to determine your own fate and your own standards so that the regulator doesn't come on upon you with more stringent rules, you want to ensure that you keep very much on that right side. Because once you break that egg, you can't, you can't unscramble a uh, scramble egg, right? So you have to always keep security foremost in your mind. And security is part of privacy law. You know, fortunately, I think the regulators don't say that you need to have you know, a certain standard. You know, I'm sure there are some standards in mind, but they usually say that you should take reasonable security, administrative, technical, operational measures to protect your data. What that means, it's really up to you because every organization is structured differently. Every organization is resourced differently. But the most important thing is you must apply your mind to it. I, from what I've seen usually is that you know, the engineers, the design folks would think of a great idea and you know, it sounds really great, but they don't involve you know, the security people. They don't involve you know, compliance, legal. You know, it's important to bring these people into the fold so that you at least address those issues. You apply your minds to it and have some due diligence to, to address the issue. Thanks, Derek. Now that we've had a little bit from all of the panel members, I'd really like to have a question from the audience. I can kind of explain the, the, what keeps me awake at night with this uh, data issue by, by sharing an, an example. Uh, I remember a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, we had a research team and they had uh, burned some data to a CD and they had left the CD in the computer and the computer had gotten old and we had returned it to the IT folks and it had gone off to be recycled with the CD still in it, with the data in it. Uh, and so we were very lucky in that the person who bought the old computer uh, realized where the CD had come from and returned it to us without using it. But if I were to sort of generalize the issue, I would say that there are many ways that the data can be checked out of the system. And the issue is that it can be difficult to verify that it's been checked back in, I guess is, is the, the technical way of, of describing that issue. Do you see a way where we could have, you know, like people going into the library, borrowing this book of data, and then someone make sure that they return it? I think a lot of organizations are, you know, have disparate systems. You know, your accounting software may not be talking to your HR software, which doesn't talk to your ERP system, which doesn't talk to your CRM, right? So unless you have a, the organization has a clear data strategy, which informs the data infrastructure, that means you need to have a vision, you need to have you know what you're going to do with the data and therefore implement the in systems and infrastructure, I think it's pretty hard to have, to have that check in and check out unless you, you know, uh, are informed. I mean, unless you have a clear view of what you want to do with the data from the, very from the very beginning and to implement the necessary processes and systems for it. I'm um, not quite sure. I mean, I wouldn't know from a technology standpoint you know, how that would be maybe, Stephen. Yeah, um, just, just one example, uh, we're rolling out about 15,000 tablets around the world and we're insisting on every tablet has security software called Airways. And that software actually traces every activity that happens on that tablet so we can monitor the use of the tablet. Because we're giving those tablets out to interviewers interviewers could do something. They could download the data or they could load some other data on it. So, yeah, we've got to be proactive in managing all of our hardware in that yeah. sense. That's just one example. I just, just an egg. It's not even your PC. You know, a lot of uh, photocopiers now these days have uh, onboard storage, you know, Xerox or Rico, whatever you use. You know, if that has on onboard storage, which then sends email, I mean, I mean uh, let's say a document which you scan and send it to your mail server, which then you know, uh, drops the document into your, your Outlook, that probably resides, that document, an image of it probably resides on your, uh, the Xerox or wherever photocopier you have. Imagine that machine being taken out for servicing or being 
discarded? Do you have proper processes to ensure all those various, you know, anything, you know, your mobile or any other document which takes an image of whatever documents you're using for business purposes? You have to have a clear strategy. So going back to the point, you know, it's not just about disparate systems. You can take one system, but you know, it's really the weakest link which brings the house down. We talk a lot about data protection and privacy in terms of passive behavioral data collection, and quite rightly so. Um, but I'm interested to get your point of view on um, differences um, in approach for mobile behavioral data collection and mobile survey data collection and some of the, um, I guess, differences we should consider in our approach. I'm not sure that there are major differences beyond informed consent. Of course, the, the detail of the information that you're protecting and the intent of use, that's, that's clearly different. And it's, to some extent, hard for somebody to have truly informed consent, particularly around passive, because sometimes they're revealing things that they're unintentionally revealing, which comes back to the you know, the mobile betraying the secrets of the heart and such things. Uh, but I think informed consent is, in my opinion, probably about as far as we could take it. As we know, a lot of people just don't read it. Right? It's pretty hard to read on the mobile phone anyway and you just usually press agree. So really it's to give, so taking a step back, you know, privacy really speaks to, uh, the genesis of privacy really is consumer protection. It's really about giving the individual the control over what you as an organization or as a person does with the data so that they can either correct it, uh, whatever wrong opinions the organization has about the, organ uh, about the person or to say stop doing it. So from a mobile behavioral analytics perspective, you know, uh, of course getting consent, putting in the notice, and of course the ability to allow the user to opt out of that uh, analytics, so you know, a soft switch within the uh, a toggle within the mobile app would be one, perhaps you know, a useful way for the user to exercise that that uh, right to control the use of the data. Um, a couple of things, maybe Nadine. Um, I know certain countries in Australia recently has just had um, new privacy uh, principles announced and. Um, one of the major things in there is, uh, is, is more detail around when you do a survey, um, you must explain who the client is and what the survey is all about. So if you're doing a, an active survey, you must explain that. Now, if it's a passive, you, you're sort of explaining what's happening, but you don't necessarily nominate the client. So that's one subtle difference between them. Um, the other thing, and I think it came up last year at the, the same conference, um, people raised, did, did people when they're doing surveys and if they're asked to take photos and, and obviously their own audio, are they aware of someone else might be in the photo or someone else might be on the audio? Then that also comes under protection. That, you know, you can't just go and take photos of people without asking for their permission if it's to be used in, in, in research. So that was one subtle thing I remember coming up last year that I don't think people thought about. They thought, well, you know, you can take selfies, but what about the guy sitting, you know, two blocks back? He's also actually had his photo taken and that might be used. <laughs> Is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah, ju just to add to that, tons and tons of people, though, they do contravene those guidelines, you know, and, uh, and some people, you know, I think, flout them, you know, quite outrageously and are not concerned by them. So you know, there's another big challenge that we can have all these wonderful guidelines and then there's breaches that you've just described and it's tough to actually enforce them, you know, either at a corporate or an individual level. But, um, just on that, um, in announcing the new principles in Australia, um, they've actually um, brought in fines of over a million dollars um, and the lawyer that the Market Research Society uh, in Australia are using said, well, a lot of this won't actually come to fruition until there is actually a test case. But what he was saying is he'll, he, he believes more than likely there will be a test case. So I think this is some other reality that we're going to face more and more that the legislators are going to want to try to prove 
the, the reality of some of the things that Dan just mentioned and, and other like events taking place. I'm particularly keen to hear about what are the obligations in terms of cross-jurisdictional projects. So, for example, a project that is run across three different continents or, or countries, which are many of the projects coming out of Singapore are, are we obliged to meet the obligations of the Market Research Society or the privacy principles within each of those countries? Is that sufficient in terms of data collection? Or do we need to overlay on top of that the Singapore requirements if the project's being uh, managed out of Singapore through subcontractors in each of the countries? What we have talked and discussed with, with the other um, market research societies has been to look at putting together something that works across the region, uh, especially for Singapore, which does so much out of Singapore. Um, for Singapore-based businesses, the way that it will work essentially would be um, that the Singapore law would overall would be the one that we manage the most. Um, we would take into consideration of course countries like Hong Kong as well. So the idea is we will provide the information um, to the companies and give them the, the right information um, that we have access to. Um, but essentially there's no teeth in anything we do outside of Singapore. Um, there's no teeth in anything we do inside Singapore. It is again just guidelines. Um, but the fact of, of um, how to manage that on a, on a broad level, it's really coming back to the APRC and the GRBN and all collaborating together and providing, um, I suppose, taking into consideration what the laws are and the differences are and then creating a master document that we can share with our members to help um, the understanding of what the different responsibilities are in each market. Um, and with, with um, so far, we are not quite there yet. So what we have done at Singa in Singapore is adopt the UK's fair data principles. Now, AMSRIS in Australia hasn't done that, um, and we don't expect them to either, but what we would want to do is collaborate to look at something that's Asia-Pacific specific um, when we're doing a lot of work in this era, and that's, um, that's probably around the next four to six months away. And I believe um, Stephen's on the working group for, for that um, at the moment. I get that question a lot. It's a real concern, European uh, legislation, wondering about what happens when you offshore, even your data processing. Uh, I think in all of this, we've got to be very cognizant of what is best practice. Um, so making sure all along that we're controlling what's actually happening with the particular respondent's actual personal data. It's very different when you get to the aggregated level. And I think, you know, if we go back to basic principles, um, the first thing you, ever, you, you did whenever you got a paper questionnaire back was to get rid of the personal information from the actual data. Um, you know, we, a lot of offshoring, um, the, the same question came up on a Q&A with the Australian principals the other day. If someone's phoning in or ringing in or, or um, subcontracting into Australia, the obligation should still be again, and I think you just mentioned it, Martin, you, you know, you've got to try and follow the laws as much as you know them in that country, but a lot of it just comes back to they should be fairly much the same as you would expect in your own country anyway. And, and that's one of the guideline areas, yeah, that I think we need to sort of guide people to say, this is best practice. Yeah, um, just to you know, address the question, I, I feel that you know, if you have a few jurisdictions which you're looking at to roll out your, you know, your, your research, uh, where you're collecting data from people in those countries, you, know, to, you have to ap adopt a highest common denominator approach. And you can't do legal arbitrage and find which is the most favorable legal jurisdiction to host your data, you know, because that won't be a good approach. My, that's my personal view. Re for various reasons. One. You know, the principles, like you say, are generally the same, but there are also some jurisdictions which are more stringent, which pose more, you know, higher risk for both the individual. You know, in some countries there are criminal, there's criminal liability attached to a breach. You know, in some countries you have really high penalties. In Australia, it's 1.7 million Australian dollars for a serious and repeated violation of the Australian privacy principles. So you have to take that highest common denominator. So even though Singapore has a very, uh, I would say, pragmatic approach to uh, data protection and privacy. You know, if you have 
the project being done in Malaysia, Taiwan, Japan, Australia, I don't think you would necessarily be able to say, well, Singapore law just applies and will take you know, that, that standard. You ha you, I think you, it's really incumbent on you to actually review the laws in Australia, in Taiwan, in Korea, in Japan, yeah. which are, by the way, generally same in terms of principles, but there are some specific differences. Simple question, at what point does data become subject to privacy laws? So when collecting survey responses, for example, are we talking only about PII data, personally identifiable information, or when is that's, it subject to privacy? That's, that's a great question. You know, it's, a real, it's a threshold question, right, which gets you into once it's personal, personal data or personal information, it's subject to the law. So I'm going to use the lawyer's response. It depends. <laughs> But to, uh, to be honest, um, well, once you have anything which can identify or reasonably identify a person, that is personal data. Now, what's reasonably identified? Some regulators have taken the view that even IP addresses are personal information, static, because some IP addresses are static. You know, and you can point them towards a certain place. You know, a certain place. Some some regulators have taken the view that persistent device identifiers. So you think about you know, um, in the previous iteration of Apple OS, you had the UDID, right? Until you reformatted the phone, it remained with you, right? And that was shared, you know, with analytics, you know, in terms of uh, developers, people. Uh, so some regulators said, well, there's only one user of the phone. Yes, I, the regulators acknowledge that the UD, and I mean those device identifiers relates to the f use of the phone, but it's that usually there's only one person using that phone and therefore you can identify the person and then match it up with different things like the location, the date and time the person act, interacted with the app, you know, the city, et cetera, right? And especially if it's geolocated. So taken in combination, you would have to take a real view, as, I mean, holistic view as to whether that data is personal information. In, most, in some countries, for example, in Singapore, if it's publicly available information, it's not. It's not subject to the law, right? Uh, I mean, there are some exceptions, you know, you got to read the guidelines for that. But in some countries, it is, like Hong, Hong Kong. So it depends, sorry. Mobile number, yes. And most regulators take, so you got to take the view that, um, so, and probably this is a question also for Stephen as well, because, you know, when we talk about aggregated data and, you know, de identifying the record, uh, if you read, for example, the Singapore regulators' uh, perspective of this, and you know, based on some research which academics have done, if you combine enough data sets together, you can put together, and if all, the, if all these data sets are publicly available, you can put together a reasonable picture of who this person is, you know, just based on those disparate data set. So you, one, although in your hands it may not be personal data, but if you do share that de-identified data with another company which has another data set which can link together using some sort of unique identifier, you could potentially then combine that into a personal, data, personal information data set. So you have to be cognizant of that and it again goes back to the concept of privacy by design. You have to get the you know, your information security in early, and you have to get even compliance people early to just think about those issues and how you're, what you're collecting, what process you're doing to de-identify, and then who are you going to disclose it to, because those are the risk. Point for Singapore as well, the postcode would be considered PII, because it's right down to block level here. Um, and in most countries, postcode could be asked a lot to get geographic regions, but here it's, it is right down to the block level. In my understanding, the UK is very similar. The, the postcode literally, Ray, goes down to like about a dozen houses in some instances. So I think Derek's point was right. Also, when you are being asked to hand over aggregate data, understand what's, what's actually happening with that data. Um, we all have contracts with our clients too. They need to understand if we're giving them back data, what are they doing? So they've got to understand all of these privacy and um, protection laws, which I know... I mean, Derek and, and most clients would be very aware of it because of the risk that's involved for them as much. In China, I understand that there's a law now preventing sending out an SMS message. Um, and 
this has made it difficult for people who have previously been doing SMS-based surveys. Um, and I was asked not long ago, um, I'm not going to mention any names, um, if, if it was possible to send an inbound SMS message into China from another country to get around this legislation. So firstly, two questions. I'm wondering if anybody in this room might know what the legislation in China specifically is and what uh, is allowed and isn't allowed. And then secondly, um, do we think that we as researchers need to avoid finding workarounds because that's just going to land us in more trouble? I have heard about the law. I, uh, is there someone in the room that knows it more specifically? I'm conscious that there is some change, uh, but the actual detail I'm not. Anyone understand the latest? I mean, there's a good example where probably we need to get some information out on that. The CRMA is the local body in China, and they should have a, a good amount of detail on this. It's come up recently. Um, I'm not overly familiar with it either, I'm afraid. Um, but the CRMA contacts over there should definitely be able to help. I'm sure it's a big issue for them as well. I understand you know, sending the SMS from a foreign country inbound to China. I would imagine that someone would be on the hook for it. Like, uh, the, you're getting information from Chinese uh, entities who is ultimately the end customer of that data, right? They're getting the insights. They probably are in China as well, right? because they want to understand who and how to reach these people. I can imagine those would be, you know, via some contract or eventually you can trace their ownership back to that person. So I'm sure the regulator would say, well, nice, nice try. You know, yes, you use a service provider outside of uh, China, but we think, you know, you are the sender. And, and to be honest, you know, if you look at most spam legislation around the world, Australia or Singapore or, you know, anywhere, you know, um, the, the word sender is actually very broadly defined. You know, it's anyone who actually sends. So you're talking about the, the infrastructure uh, and the systems provider, but also the person who commissioned it to authorize the sending of the SMS. So if you can link that to that person in China, he's going to be on the hook for it, yeah, even though he tried to do some legal arbitrage. Yeah. By benefit of starting early, we've actually managed to squeeze some extra time into a panel session on privacy, which may have been something we wouldn't have expected to need to do today. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for asking their questions. I'd also like to encourage you, if you've got some concerns or things that you'd like people like SMR and your local associations to look into, Stephen's put up his hand and said he wants to be told these things, so now's a really great opportunity to talk to people about the sort of things you need your industry to help you with. And I mean, I think in terms of summing up today's panel discussion, we're really getting a theme of, you know, these issues aren't set in stone, things are evolving, things are changing, and particularly for people who are working across multiple regions, there aren't always clear-cut answers, and if you need advice, you should be seeking it. Martin's been very generous with what the Singapore Market Research Society are doing, and obviously SMR and other associations, you know, are looking at what they can do to help people. So take advantage, and I think Derek could probably advise you all, if you're ever in any doubt, seek some legal advice if you need it. So keeps, keeps me in a job. Yeah, keeps me in a job. <laughs> okay, and I'd like to very much thank my panel members for joining me today. I think the breadth and depth of your experience has been fabulous, so thank you very much.